17, right? 17, we're going to finish 17 today. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back after a, a few weeks hiatus to our uh, Stanya series. We're in the middle of chapter 17. Actually, we did quickly finish it last time, but I'm going to go over this chapter again. So this chapter concludes a, uh, the first, what you can call the first section of the 53 chapters of Tanya. Chapter 18 starts something else. What was the purpose of the Tanya? You remember the title page, the al Rebbe writes that the reason he wrote this book is to clarify how the verse that Moshe Rabbeinu says to the Jewish people at the end of his life he tells the Jewish people that the matter of Judaism is not across the sea, not in the heavens, it's rather, it's very near to you. The matter is very near to you, Judaism. To do with your mouth, to speak, to learn, to do with the mouth. With your heart, and to do. Usually, when we say that, we, we read that verse. <coughs> Before we read that verse, what the Al-Tarebbe wants to accomplish with this book is to explain how indeed the matter of Judaism is close to every one of us. Because seemingly, one can argue it is not very close certainly not the part where the, the verse refers to Lvovcha, with your heart. What does with your heart mean? To mean to love Hashem in a real way where you take full control of your life. Meaning your whole behavior system, your thought, speech, and action are all dedicated and directed towards godliness. That means every thought and every word and every deed is God-oriented, God-focused. How, how easy is that? So the thing is like this. Dal Tarebbe and Tanya laid out a few foundations. From chapter 1 to chapter 17, I'll do a quick synopsis. In order to explain this, how, how it's indeed near to us, he began to explain every Jew has two souls. He has a human soul and a godly soul. And the godly soul is made up of ten faculties, as is the human soul made up of ten faculties. The ten faculties are subdivided into two sections, or two groups. One is the intellectual, three intellectual faculties, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And then there's the seven emotional attributes, love, fear, etc. And so does the animal soul, the human soul, have the same ten faculties. It has its wisdom, it has its knowledge, it has its understanding, and it also has its emotions. It loves things, it's attracted to things, it rejects things, and it has all these different emotions, just like the godly soul. So it's really a good balance between the good and the, and the, the, the self-centered and the God-centered two souls, right? In addition to these ten faculties, or to the two souls itself, we also have three garments. Three garments are thought, speech, and action. And they are the expressions through which the two souls function. Right? If the soul has a thought, it has a meaning to say it has it understands something, it loves something, how does it express that love? Through either words, through either actions, and through, through its thought. The purpose of the Torah, the purpose of... <coughs> <coughs> What's required of every one of us, every Jew, is primarily to take control of our actions, of our, our gar garments. Our thoughts, words, and actions should all be pure, should all be God-centered. It's not so simple. We don't expect from every Jew to have this burning love for Hashem, where to the point where he's completely um, blotted out or canceled out any other passion in life. But the only passion in life is God. 
Only tzaddikim reach that level. Only the really righteous reach such a level. What is expected from us is to take control of our behavior. Our thoughts should be clean, good, our words should be good, and our actions should be good. How do you get it to a point? Now, think about that. What we're saying is that every one of us should be completely dedicated all the time in every thought, word, or act. That's not easy. It's not simple. You could do it, but it's not a, it's a very, it takes, it takes work. How do you get to such a point where you should never give in to the passions and desires of your human soul? You have to develop a real passion for God. You really have to love Hashem. To the point where you're not going to let any other love distract you. You may have other loves, but it won't distract you to the point where you're going to act on those loves. You get what I'm saying? You know, your thoughts, your words, your thought, speech, and action will never, will never become the expression, will never express those foreign passions. Only the godly passions will manifest in thought, speech, and action. Correct? It's what we learned till, for many, many, you know, chapters. But for that to happen, you have to have a real passion in your heart for Hashem, for real. I mean, I'm talking about you have to really be attracted to Hashem, to always get, do what Hashem wants and never do what your self-centered desires dictate. How do you get to love Hashem like that? How do you develop such a passion and love for Hashem? This is the key. You have to get to know Hashem. And you got to use your brain and your thoughts and your intellect to completely dedicate time to delve and think about how great God is, every different element so that you can humanly possible grasp. You have to do that. Because once you grasp, you have a sophisticated grasp of God, you, uh, you may be able to, you know, then you'll be able to do it. Because understanding the greatness will then bring you to have a love for Hashem. I have to plug this in because this is going to die in a minute. There's an extension cord in there. Do you mind getting that? It's in that first cubby. <coughs> no, the one near that, on the bottom. Now, does this love that we're talking about have to be completely, have to be a, a, a love that's palpable in your heart to feel this burden? Yes. 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 So I'm sorry that we got cut off. I'm sorry that we got cut off. Um, but we're in the middle of chapter 17. We were discussing the build-up of the Tanya's first 17 chapters. In chapter 16, the Alter Rebbe said, yes, indeed, you have to develop a sophisticated love for Hashem, which comes from a sophisticated understanding of God. But that love doesn't have to be a palpable love in your heart. You don't have to have a burning feeling of love in your heart for Hashem. That's not everyone is capable. <laughs> not everyone is capable of developing that. But what you have to have is at least the type of love that is the result of your understanding, as I said, this, this deep contemplation, that if you can produce the love in the heart, at least in your mind, you're completely dedicated, you understand and you realize this is lovable, you come to the conclusion this is completely, this is, Hashem is lovable, and that's, that's what I should love, and that's what I can be completely committed to. And then you'll act on it. So it may not be this fire in your heart, but it is a fire in your heart, in your brain at least. <laughs> now, that's what Al Tarebbe said until chapter 16, including 16. What he's going to say now in 17 <clears throat> is that this will now be, this will now fit. The verse that he is now that he uh, began the whole time with, 
which is that verse in the Ruranim where Moses tells the Jewish people, it's not far from you, it's near to you, very near to you, to love Hashem, to, 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 in your heart, in your, in your heart, in your, in your, sorry, in your mouth, b'ficha, in your heart, to b'lbofcha, l'asoyseh, to do. al Tarab is going to now question this verse and sum up this, this section, okay? Let's read it inside. It's in chapter 17, page 71, in your bilingual edition. With above in mind, one can understand the scriptural text, but the thing is very near, near to unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. That verse that we discussed. And the Al-Tarebbe said that this is the verse that he wants to explain with the writing of the Tanya, how it's near to you. At first glance, the statement that the thing is very nigh to thee, unto thee is in thy heart, seems to be contrary to our experience. Yet the Torah is eternal. You can't say that it was true back in the desert. Today you're right. Today it's not practical anymore. No, the Torah is eternal. It has to be true for today as well. For it is not a very nice thing to change one's heart. What does it say? It's near to you to also in the heart. But it's not. It is not very nice, a nice thing to... It is not a very nice thing to change one's heart from mundane desires to a sincere love of God. Indeed, it is stated in the Gemara and the Talmud, it's, is, is fear of heaven a small thing? Even fear of heaven is not a small thing. How much more so is love? Love is much more difficult to develop than fear. So it's not a small thing. So why are you telling me it's near? Moreover, the rabbis also said that only tzaddikim have control over their hearts. Total control over your heart is only in the, by the tzaddikim. So what are you telling me is near to you? In other words, not only is it not near to you, it's not even possible for you. You're not a tzaddik. Only a tzaddik has total control of his heart. But the words thou mayest do it in that verse refer to a love which merely leads to the performance of the commandments. This being the hidden desire of the heart even if it does not glow openly in the flame, as, uh, like flaming coals. What we learn in chapter 16, that, that, that the love that Hashem is expecting of us is the love that comes from the mind. Once you understand that God is really a, a wonderful, wonderful thing, a good thing, a lovable thing, and that's where you make the decision that this is lovable, I'm committing myself to it. That, at least that ability you do have. Now let's read it in the words of this verse. Very interesting, Dal Rebbe points out the nuances in this verse. Usually, when we read this verse, when Moshe says, Ki the matter is near to you, very near to you, b'ficha in your mouth, to do it, to speak of it, to learn it, to, you know, all that, in your mouth part, uvilvavchan in your heart, and say and to do, right? So we think of it as three things. In speech, heart, which is the emotion, and action. But Dal Tareb is going to say that the wording over here does not lead to that. It's not three different things. Beficha is one thing, Uvulvav Chalas is another thing. They go together. What is the meaning of this? In your heart, what part, what can, what the, I, in other words, what kind of love is it, is what kind of love for Hashem is accessibly very, very near to you to develop the type of love of Ulvavcha that leads to say that leads to action. In other words, what we say in chapter 16, that the love that we are, that the love in the heart, we're like flaming coals, that's not so easy to develop. Not everyone can develop that. But at least a love that leads you to the, to, to the decision this is love, I'm going to do that, I'm going to commit myself to Hashem, to, 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 to start acting in, in the ways of Hashem, only that love everyone can develop.
Because where does that love reside? Where is that love to be found? It's not a flaming coals in the. It's not a flaming love in your heart. It's more in the mind. You remember we learned in sixteen that there's a love in the mind, a love in the heart. The love in the mind is you. You 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 contemplate the greatness of Hashem. You really understand how really wonderful it is. And the more you learn, the more you the more you think, the more you know, the more great you realize it is. And therefore lovable and worthy of your commitment to it. So it's that love in your heart, in the love, that at least leads you to make the commitment to act on it. It may not be a love that you feel in your heart, but it's a love in the mind that leads you to act upon, to commit to doing what he wants. That is possible. Let's read it now to Rebbe's words. That's possible and very near to you. But the words... That thou may do it <coughs> refers to a love which merely leads to the performance of the commandments. <coughs> this being the, lo- the hidden desire of the heart, it's hidden. It's not open in the heart, but it's hidden. Even if it does not glow openly like flaming coals. This thing is very near. And it is easy for any person who has brains in his head. All you need is a brain. Because all it takes is thinking. Contemplate and that you can do. For his brain is under his control. You may not have your heart under your control, but you do have your brain in your control. You can decide what to think any time of the day. Right? You have control of that. It's under his control and he is able to concentrate on to concentrate it, the mind, on anything he wishes. If then he will contemplate with it on the greatness of the ain't blessed ain't of the infinite God, he will inevitably generate in his mind at least, maybe not in the heart, a full flaming coal love, but in the mind at least, the love of God to cleave unto him through the performance of his commandments and Torah. And, on, and, and the Alter Rebbe continues, and this constitutes the whole purpose of man. That's really what it's all about. That's really what we expect from a man down here while he's alive for 120 years. <clears throat> the place where you're going to really feel a burning love for Hashem is in heaven. When you get to heaven, the Neshama will be in love with Hashem. Down here, what's the purpose of man? To develop a love enough to get you to act upon it. That's possible. And that's really all what, what really what you really have to accomplish here on this earth. And this constitutes the whole purpose of man. For it is written, this day is to do them. This day meaning this life on earth. Is the purpose is to do them. That's the this is the place of action. And anything that you need to get you to act, that's what we need from you today in this life. What do we need for you to get you to act? Contemplate enough to have a, at least a love in your mind that will get you to be committed. The burning love in the heart, it's great if you have it, but that's going, that will come to everyone in the next world. In this world, we need you to act. Well, how do we get you to act? Contemplate on the greatness of God. You'll then develop a, on your mind at least a love for Hashem that will get you to be committed. That's all. This day referring specifically to the world of physical action. While tomorrow in the afterlife is the time of reward, as explained elsewhere. And what's the reward? This basking in the radiance of God and glowing in His, in His, and and, and, and and being one with it, and, you know, and being a tr- completely, you know, the love that we describe, right? This burning over well, there, you're going to love Hashem. You're going to be in this incredible attraction. You'll be one with Hashem. I, that, that's not for today. <coughs> it could. It's great if you can reach that today. That but that, the, yeah, if you, can, if you have a neshama of a tzaddik, you'll reach it. And even a bainini sometimes can reach it. But not trips. everyone. What? You get trips. Like you said, yeah, yeah, true. Now, the mind in turn, the mind in turn, by virtue of its inherent nature, is master of the left part of the heart. Now, when you contemplate in your mind, yeah, when you contemplate in your mind, you're going to take control of your heart. That's what's going to happen. Because the mind is in control of the heart. The mind, we learned that in chapter 12, that the mind has a natural supremacy over the heart. It's stronger than the heart. Look what he says. The mind, in turn, by virtue of its inherent nature, 
is master over the left part of the heart and over the mouth and all the limbs, which are the instruments of action. Except in him, who is completely wicked. The wicked person who is completely wicked, we learned that there are two different categories of wicked people, right? just like there are two categories of righteous. There are two categories of wicked people. One is the Rosh of the the one who has good in him. He doesn't always sin. And there's many myriads of levels within that alone. Some people sin once a day, some people sin once every five minutes. But they always do, they, but they also have good in them. They still have a connection to good. They regret their bad deeds, they do certain things that are good and so on. That's most of us. But then there's the completely wicked. He has no regrets. It's so bad that he doesn't even have a connection to his good side anymore. His good has been banished from him and it, it hovers above him. So it's not personally in, he's not personally in touch with it. Let's see it. Let's see it in the words. Except in him who is completely wicked. As the rabbi said that the wicked are under the control of their heart. They are under the control of their heart. They have no control. The heart controls them. But their heart is in no wise controlled by them. <coughs> there are some Rishoyim, like most of, the, most of us, who we don't control our heart, but we're not totally under the control of our heart either. There's a difference. You don't control your heart means you're not in total control. You get sometimes the heart gets you. Your heart, your animal souls, your human souls, passions get the better side of you. you get a better, it gets you. But you're not totally under control of the heart. There are certain people that are so wicked that they're in total control of the heart. You see that with people that have addictions. What happens when someone's addicted? They have substance abuse or whatever it may be. He can't even help himself. He knows that he's messed up. He wants to break out, but he can't. He would like to get break out. He'd love to make a mention of himself. He can't. He's addicted. He's under the control of this addiction. There are certain that are showing that are under the control of their addiction. The addiction means to sin. Their animalistic side. And they lost control. Now there are people that that can be applied to one sin. There are some people that are so addicted to a certain sin that they can't help themselves. They can't overcome that sin. They'll do many other mitzvahs. They'll do many, you know, less of other sins. But there's one sin that they, they, they've done so much of it that they can't overcome it anymore. So there is, you know, it's not total. There's certain, there are certain wicked people that are completely under the spell of their, of their human desires and they just have no connection to good anymore. That total, that, that really completely gone. But even regular people, that sometimes you're not in control of certain behaviors. And it's a tragedy when that happens. It's a punishment. You lose control. So some of us lost control with one thing. They can't control that certain area. They, they, they've given in so much to it that, they don't, that they, they're almost like locked in. But the question then becomes, so then when Moshe says the Torah is near to you, it's not true anymore. It's near to most people, then not to these Rashaim, not to these wicked people. So how could that be? Moshe is talking to every Jew, not just to rest certain Jews. So if it's near, supposed to be near to every Jew, how, what about these wicked people? There's no, there should be no exception. The al Rebbe is making an exception. So the al Rebbe says like this. There's two questions al is going to address. Number one, how could you tell me that these Rashoim are under, that they have no control anymore? Isn't it true that the mind controls the heart by birth? It's a natural thing. It's a natural thing that if you put your hand in fire, you're going to have pain, right? It's a natural thing that your mind controls your heart. It's by birth, so how, how do you lose that? Is it a possibility that you should put your hand in your finger, finger in fire and you shouldn't feel it? Doesn't happen, right? How could this happen? If this is a natural thing, it's not some kind of spiritual thing. It's a natural thing. 
So what happens to the Rishonim? How do they lose that? So he says it's a punishment. That's the next thing. Except we're on, this, on the left column by the circle, that line. Except in him who is completely wicked, as the rabbi said, that the wicked are under the control of their heart, but their heart is in no ways contro- uh, controlled by them. They don't control, they're totally under the spell of the heart. And I will ask, but it's a natural thing to have control over your heart. He says, this is a punishment for them. For the enormity and potency of their sin. Hashem took it away from them. It's a punishment. It's, so, it's not natural. You're right. God punished them. I now he's going to address another question, the one I just mentioned. How could it be that Moshe says that it's near to every Jew? How did he tell me now that he should have said, except for these? He doesn't say except. He's including every single Jew, even these Rishoyim. So why are they not? Why, 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 how could it be that's not near to them? The al is essential saying, for them it isn't near. You're right. But then, then who's Moshe is only talking to the majority, not, the, not, not everyone? He's talking to everyone. She says, no. <coughs> That's the next thing he's going to address. This is, where are we? But the Torah does not speak of these dead who in their life are called dead. Moshe is talking to living people. He's not talking to dead people. People that have fallen into sin to this level where their good has departed them, they're already not connected. What's the source of life? God. If their goodness, their neshama, their godliness, their holiness is above them, it's super. It's, it's already, out, you know, it doesn't affect them on a personal level, an internal way. So they're dead. They're talking not alive. Moshe doesn't address such people. He's addressing the living, not the dead. And these people are considered dead even while they're alive physically. But the Torah does not speak of these dead who in their life are called dead. Why are they called dead? Because as I said, the source of life is God. Where does life come from? Hashem. If you disconnect it from Hashem, you have no life. Then you consider dead. And they have lost touch with their good. Their Nisham. It hovers above them. Indeed, it is impossible for the wicked to begin to serve God without their first repenting their past. Can't start. He can't change his ways if he doesn't. Start. He can't start. First thing he has to do is chew it. That's what he says in there. Indeed, it is impossible for the wicked to begin to serve God. Those wicked. These are super wicked. Without their first repenting for their past. How do you? What's the repentance? What happened to these people? Why are they in such a state? Well, they gave. They, they've succumbed too much to the sin. What does this mean? They've succumbed too much to klipa. You know what Klippa is, right? By now everyone knows what Klippa is. In other words, they built a wall around them and God. The Klippa is a shell. It's a husk. It blocks any... any uh, God penetrates us, right? This Nishama penetrates us. God's light, the, the, the holy... They built a wall that they, it doesn't penetrate them anymore. Is it voluntary? Or or is it they've done that. They've done that because they've chosen to do that. But the... the are there circumstances that may... Yeah, sometimes it's their parents could have done better with them. Sometimes, they, whatever the whatever circumstance is, is yeah. but it's usually their own doing, you know. Sometimes you just build up a system of justification. Nature and nurture, right? It's nature and nurture. It's more nurture. It's more, yeah, they, they, they've yeah, given it. A person that has been dealt a very bad hand doesn't choose to go bad or... On the Usually, Pat, listen, your environment has a lot to do with how you're going to be brought up. No mm-hmm. question about it. The education you get. There's a lot of factors. But at the end of the day, this is the ch- life they chose. And what happens is they build such a wall around them, between them and God, that God doesn't penetrate anymore. So how do you start serving a God again if you have such a wall? You've got to break the wall. Mm-hmm. How do you break the wall? You've got to break this clipper wall. That's the next thing he's going to say. Indeed, it is impossible for the wicked to begin to serve God without their first repenting for their past in order to shatter the wall of Klippa. You've got to break that wall. Which form a sundering curtain. They form a real thick curtain and an iron partition that interpose between them and their Father in Heaven. By means, how do you break this wall? How do you break this partition? 
by means of contriteness of heart, contriteness of heart and bitterness of soul over their sins, as is explained in the Zohar and the verse, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. God's the best, the best sacrifice. When you have a broken heart over your sins, you can bring a big bull to the altar. You don't have a broken heart because of your sin. The bull is just a bull. The real sacrifice, your broken heart over the sin you did. So you first have to break your heart. I say break my heart. You have to break the clipper. How does that happen? By having a contrite, broken feeling of how did I do this to myself? <coughs> a broken and contrite heart for, through breaking one's heart and spirit of uncleanliness of the sitra akhra of the other side of the clipper, the sitra akhra is broken. See, uh, the Zohar and uh, Parshas Pinchas, page 240, and then Parshas Vayikra, page 8, and page 5, and the commentary of the Ramaz Dira. This is the category of lower repentance. Here comes an interesting thing that al Qarab is going to say. Before we go into this, I think I spoke about this last time, but I'll elaborate on it. Hashem's name is Yud, four letter name, right? Yud, a He, then a Vav, and then a He, right? That's the four letter name of Hashem. What are these four letters? These four letters represent the way Hashem's infinite light or infinite energy descends and, and comes down into the world. First it comes in as a Yud. It, it first appears as a Yud. A Yud is a dot. What's a Yud? A tiny little it's a dot. A flash of God's light. Then it, the hay. Hay goes this way and that way. So it's the length and the breadth. And the, the breadth and the length. The, the God begins to descend and become, it's not just a dot anymore. It, becomes, it begins to take shape, so to say. Mm -hmm. And then it comes down. The Vav. The Vav is a vertical line representing God coming down through the world. And then the hay, mm -hmm. as it manifests in this world, down here. Get it? To some degree. Okay. <coughs> Again, I want to point out the four letters. The Yud is a the beginnings of the revelation of Hashem. What is it? First it comes in a undefined dot. Undefined flash of uh, flash of godly light. It's represented by Yud, which is a dot. But then that light begins to form, so to say, for lack of a better word, where it begins to be appreciated on its length and breath. That's the hay. The Vav, I said again, is now that, that now, that formation of whatever you want to call the form God, length and breath, begins to descend down through the vertical line, which represents the vertical downward progression of God's light through the worlds until it reaches the lowest of the realms, which is our world, in the form of another hay, which is represented again, that it manifests down here in the length and breath. Okay? It turns out that there are two hays in this God's name. Yud hay, and then a vav, and then another hay. The two hays represent length and breadth, right? Where it's no longer a dot, it spreads. It spreads out, so to say. But the her first hay is the higher hay, which he spreads out in the higher, in the higher worlds. <coughs> the lower hay is where he spreads down in this world, where he spreads out in this world. That's basically the Yenushami. What is the neshama? The neshama is part of Hashem's name. It's a piece of Hashem, right? al Rebbe said in the second chapter, it's a piece of Hashem. What's the neshama? It's the last word, la, the, the neshama that descends into your body, that's the lower hay of Hashem, of Hashem's name. It's a piece of Hashem that's in your soul, in your body, in your existence. It's your neshama. It's the lower hay of Hashem's name. Well, now what happens when you're down here and you start deciding, I'm going to eat treif, I'm going to lie and cheat, and who knows what, bad things. 
It's not only your body that's doing these bad things, your brain. You're schlepping your neshama into that. It's a package deal. It's not like you say, I'm going out to sin, you neshama, you stay home. I'll, get, I'll be back in 15 minutes, we'll connect again. It doesn't happen that way. The neshama goes with you. Wherever you go, the neshama is going with you. So you're schlepping Hashem into the pit. So you took the letter He and you destroyed it. And you schlepped it into the pit. Into the world of Klipta. So what's Tshuva? What is the word Tshuva made up of? Two words. Toshuv, He. You got to return the He. You got to return Hashem's last, the second He, the lower He, back to where it is. Then back to where it belongs. Out of the Klipta. So the broken heart that the al Tareb is talking about, that's the lower level of tshuva. To literally release the lower hay and the shama from the pit. From God's, God's lower hay from out of the klipa. That's the first thing you have to do. How does that happen? Through a broken and contrite heart. Let's see it. Beer, yeah, where am I? Um, for, though, for through breaking one's heart, the spirit of, yeah, we did that. Okay, let's be on the right column by the triangle. This is the category of the lower repentance. There's two levels of repentance. We're talking about the lower repentance. Breaking your heart, feeling contrite, whereby the lower letter He is raised up from its fall into the forces of evil, which is the mystery of the Shekhinah in exile. That's God's in exile. God is in exile when you sin. Because he's the the last hay is not is, is a piece of Hashem. It's part of Hashem. As our rabbis of blessed memory state that when they, the Israelites, were exiled into Edom, the Shekhinah went with them. So the simple meaning of it is when they went to Edom, it's a certain country. When they went into exile, God went with them. But it's a deeper meaning here. That is to say, the word Edom is representative of something deeper. When a person practices the acts of Edom, What's Edom? Edom is here understood allegorically as the embodiment of evil. When a person exiles himself into into the into Edom, which is the, into evil, the Shechin is also dragged dragged down there. He degrades and brings down to there this divine spark which vitalizes his nefesh, ruach and neshama that are clothed within him in the animal soul of the klipa. Because where is the neshama enclosed? The neshama is enclosed in your godly soul. They work in tandem. They work together. One is in the other. Which is in the left part of the heart. The klip is in the left one. You give in to the klipa's desires. Your desire is schlepping the godly soul which is, in the, which is enclosed in your human soul into the who knows where, into the world's worst places. Which reigns over him as long as he remains wicked. Dominating the small city, the body, while the nefesh, ruach, and the are forced into exile under it. But when his heart breaks within him, and the spirit of uncleanliness, and of the sitra is broken, and the forces of evil are dispersed, then the shechina rises from its fall, and remains upright, as is explained elsewhere. Any questions, first of all? What the Al-Tarebbe just concluded in this last column is that you're right. The really wicked Rishoyim, the full-fledged Rishoyim, wicked, are not capable of, of serving Hashem the way they should. It's not near to them. Because they have no control. That's a punishment. Ah, you'll say, but then the Moshe is not talking to them. You're right, he's not talking to them. They're dead. The How do you get them to be alive again? They're stuck. How do you get them to be alive again? They have to really recognize their pit, where they are, and be totally contrite over it, broken-hearted over it. That starts breaking down the, 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 the uh, wall they built up around them and God and to, to, to get rid of the klipa. Once they start shattering the klipa by themselves having a broken heart over this, little by little the, the, the light can start penetrating again. And the hay can get back up to where it needs to be. And then they can start all over again. 
They can start from scratch. They can become a mensch again. But before they do that, you're right, there's no way for them. But most of us are not in that level. Most of us, it is absolutely available to us at least to develop that love in your mind that will produce the actions and the commitment. And that's what Meshach Rabbeinu said. Let's read it. Let's repeat the words of Meshach. The matter is near to you, very near to you, in your mouth, and in your heart, what level of heart? We talk about La Seisa that leads you to at least action. So it may not be in the heart, in the full-fledged love of the heart, but at least it's the level of love that brings you to action, the commitment of the mind. It's enough. With this, al Rebbe concludes 17, the chapter 17, and the first in the open the title page of the Dalta Rebbe, at the end of the title page, said like this <coughs> that the purpose of this book is to explain how this is near to every one of us, right? In a long, short way. That's how he said. In a long way and a short way. And these 17 chapters, Dalta Rebbe took us through the long way. The long way is there's two interpretations as to to what the Alter Rebbe says. It can either mean the long short way, or it can mean two things. I'm going to teach you first the long way and then the short way, or it means the short long, the long short way. The famous story in the Talmud that a sage was once in a fork in the road and he was lost. He didn't know how to, which direction to take. And a young boy was there, and he asked him, you know, young man, where do I, where, how do I get to this in this location? So he said to him, this is the short, long way. And this is the long, short way. So he heard first short, he took the short, long way. He went there, got to the city very quickly, but there was terrain that was very difficult to manage to climb hills and over over gates and over fences, over walls, forget about it. He gave up. Came back to the fork and the kid was still there. So he told me it's a short way. He said, but I told you it's a short, long way. This is the long, short way. It's a longer path, but it's straight. You can get there. It'll take you longer, but it's shorter ultimately. So some have said that when Dr. Rebbe said the long, short way he meant, I'm going to teach you in Tanya it's tack along, but it's, it ultimately gets to you in a more healthy way. That's chapters 1 to 17. It's a long way. You have to delve, learn. It's about serving Hashem in a way that you have to develop love in your heart through a contemplation of God's greatness. It's very, very arduous. This isn't an easy process. But it's the short way ultimately. It's long, but it's ultimately the short way. And we'll explain next week why. But then there's the short, long way. In chapter 18, he begins to explain the shorter way, but ultimately the longer way. What the Alter Rebbe is going to say is you really don't have to really develop any love in your heart. Because you already have a love. You have an inborn love, just access it. It's a hidden love. And that's a very easy way to access God, but it's, the problem is it's hidden. So every time you reveal it, it, you didn't really work hard to reveal it, so it goes back into hiding. So it's every 15 minutes, every day, every two weeks, you have to wake it up again. Once you do the first long way, you develop a love in your heart that's always going to stay there. If you develop a love that comes from intellect, that comes from contemplation, it's never going to sleep. It's always going to be in your heart. It takes long to develop such a love. But once it's there, it's there. So it's long but short. It's the same thing here when they teach you math, for example. They teach you the, the hardest way and you never learn. Or, for example, somebody that, you know, it's hard for them to learn math, you never learn it. Instead of, you know, teaching you like a, you know, like you were a, a little worm and you wouldn't understand this, but they, you know, they teach you the long way and you, like you say, you never forget it. If they don't do it, I don't, I don't know why, but it is the, 
the most uh, in chap- effective way. In chapter is- 18, he's going to, through 25, the next section. Fascinating stuff. I'd like to encourage you all to find, to, to, to try to get someone to come with you from now on. Inspire another person to come. You'll do them the greatest favor ever. Because the topics that are going to be discussed in 7, 18, 19, 20, 21, incredible. Absolutely incredible. So I'm going to cut it tonight. It's the end of chapter 17. Thank you very much, and we'll continue next week. Thank you. That's God awesome. willing. What? With the clauses that you had, you could have easily just said, uh, I'm, not, you know, I'm not up there tonight. You were fighting it. Good night, everyone watching. I'm sorry for the breakup in the middle of the video there. It went blank. Mm-hmm.